So I'll go ahead and uh, get started uh, today. Since this is the last day and there, there's a, a few fewer people here, we can go ahead and ask, ask questions as we go through the uh, slides. <clears throat> today, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, GeoPlatform, the background, the metadata, the infrastructure that we build in AWS, the services, including the uh, the raster and vector tile services and Taria map services, and then uh, wrap up. And for any, uh, for our goal for today is to present um, Geo Platform to the ESIP community and to get feedback. And any time, uh, whether it's here or later that you think of things, please uh, send us your feedback. We're really working to improve uh, Geo Platform's uh, services uh, and metadata and uh, catalog. And first up, I'll hand this over to, uh, to Joel Schlegel. He's the uh, Geo Platform um, uh, technical lead. Let me pull up uh, those slides here. Thanks, Chris, uh, for setting that up and, and for choreographing our, our uh, our briefing here, and, and thank you to everybody uh, in the ESIP community, uh, freezing in Pittsburgh and uh, warm everywhere else uh, uh, for attending. Um, I'm going to do a little bit, uh, go over a little bit of background on Geo Platform. Uh, many of you may be familiar with it, maybe, uh, maybe not. It's a key part of the national spatial data infrastructure. It's been around for a long time. But really what we're going to do today and what we've been doing over the last few months to years is really trying to not reinvent geo platform, but really try and dig in and find what can make geo platform a useful tool to the community of data producers and providers. Um, and by that, I mean, we all know we all know metadata, we all know metadata is important. And I just briefed one of our senior executives the other day and she said, Joel, you're, you're, you're just saying the same thing. I, I, heard, I heard this briefing for 20 years about metadata, I know it's important. Um, but I feel like what I've learned in my work on Geo Platform isn't that just that metadata is really is important or that it's really, really important. It's like the most important thing in our world right now because there's so much data and so many sources um, as, as producers of data, we struggle to find users of our data just as much as people who want to find our data struggle to find it. And, and the tools that we have, I think, you know, to be honest, just aren't, you know, aren't meeting, meeting the requirement. You know, if, if you have a community that knows about your data or you know what you're looking for, I think we can find our data, but to discover data, to discover new information, um, metadata, as, you know, as it's generally produced right now, um, DCAT metadata, um, you know, brief metadata is just not quite doing it. You know, the metadata standards aren't quite there, the metadata training's not quite there, the metadata discipline's not quite there. Um, with all that, you know, all those um, caveats or downers about metadata, I think GeoPlatform is doing a fantastic job uh, with the tools and the metadata we have. And so you can hear about that, And it, but it's what, as Chris said, I think what we're looking for is how can we be useful? How can we drive traffic to your data how can we uh, help you find data, um, either as a you know either as a team of experts or as a system, right? I think Geo Platform is here to help, and that's that's what I think our role is in the Earth Science uh, uh, community. So, with that introduction, um, I, I'll go through a few slides on Geo Platform to kind of set the context, and then Chris will uh, uh, dig in on metadata, and I'll come back to talk about our service platform, and then we'll wrap it up. And as Chris said, uh, we're both happy to take questions anytime along the way. Um, um, and that's it. All right, next slide, please, Chris. So
so I mentioned your platform's been around for many years. There's a whole set of guidance, OMB Circular 816, uh, National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Um, but a lot of that information has been refreshed as of 2018. And I'm certainly not going to go through this uh, through the law line by line. But I think it's just, just reading the chapter headings is a nice place to kind of set the stage as to what are some of the key elements of federal geospatial data management. And the first part is an interagency group called the Federal Geographic Data Committee. Um, each agency in the United States government has representation on that and participates. Uh, uh, and that becomes the guiding, uh, for, guiding body for uh, geo, geo platform. Um, there's a National Geospatial Advisory Committee, which is a uh, uh, sits kind of over the FGDC and it's an, generally an outside body of subject matter experts who help guide the federal geographic data committee in, in, in its direct, you know, with its policy. 2804 talks about national spatial data infrastructure and specific national and geospatial data assets. And we can talk about those later. Um, some discussion of geospatial data standards uh, geo and geo platform, and then certain responsibilities. So it's a, it's a current law. It's easy to read, um, and it kind of sets the context for what um, what Congress thinks of uh, of um, geospatial data uh, in in the you know recent you know recent times, 2018. Uh, next slide. Um, I pulled just a few sections out of it to talk you know to talk about. Um, Again, what's 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 important about geospatial data to Congress that they put in a law, um, and it's some of the things that we all I think you know see as our probably see as our shared values. Open and publicly available data is essential to successful operation of geo platform. But because we want it to not be open for geo platform, we want it to be open for the public and for industry, for uh, startups and services, for economic growth, right, and for advancing scientific research. All of those um, are the pay, you know, is what the nation derives from the data we produce and the data we share. And again, GeoPlatform's role is to facilitate finding and using that data. The next slide. And then just, I think this is the last one. It, it says, what is, what is GeoPlatform? I, I, I had a, a long list of things that I said GeoPlatform was, but I thought I would just go to, go, you know, go to the tape and see what Congress said it is. GeoPlatform is an internet system available through a common interface that includes metadata for all geospatial data collected by covered agencies, directly or indirectly, and includes download access to all open geospatial data directly or indirectly collected by covered agencies. So it's a pretty long, Oh, and then a set of programming instructions, which sounds like an API to me, and standards providing automated means of accessing available geospatial data. And so you're just going to see throughout this talk us hitting kind of point by point the um, elements on this slide that Congress says GeoPlatform shall. This, you know, this becomes our work plan. This becomes our direction. We have a long, like I say, a lot of things we could do, but we try and really just associate every action with a specific line item right here. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, that's that's the overview and background. Um, feel free to dig, dig in there. Um, I put the link back to the uh, Geospatial Data Act and also the FGDC site. Um, there's a lot of information there on uh, data and standards. But here's the, um, geo, here's the geo platform homepage. Uh, it's a, it's a nice look, I think a very nice looking uh, information portal. We kept it super clean. You interact with it with, this, with a simple search uh, to begin uh, your discovery of uh, geospatial data. And we'll go through how it works later, but uh, next slide. Um, I, I left this in here just to kind of show you some of the ways, some of the things that we're uh, focusing on for 2022. And I'll, um, in a, that kind of gives you a, like a sense, again, a sense of our folk, a sense of our focus. 
Um, reliable metadata processing viewing, you'll, you'll, you'll hear more about that. The metadata insights is Chris's briefing. I'll be talking about support for emerging standards, particularly with uh, stack catalogs and the OGC API. Um, we're gonna talk about our knowledge base and how important it is for us to share our information. Um, and then working to uh, integrate our open data and our open platform with uh, tools like Esri Hub and Esri Hosting to facilitate use of geospatial data that might not be in an Esri format to make it uh, more discoverable and digestible uh, for the, the community of Esri users, who's obviously a large community, uh, but not the entire community. Uh, we've, we do a lot and we're not gonna touch on it all as far as cybersecurity and configuration management. Uh, but one thing we've done is switch to login.gov for authentication within GeoPlatform. That allows us to use a standard uh, authentication authorization mechanism that's uh, used uh, if you apply for USA jobs or uh, I think veterans benefits now. So many people are using the same account. So we're relying on a, a account. Um, you don't need a GeoPlatform account now. You use a, a shared federal uh, sign on or your CAC or PIB if you're a, a Fed. Um, focus on outreach. Uh, Chris McDermott, who just kicked us off, has really been the lead here. Um, really just trying to so go problem by problem or data type by data type and, and not just leave things as technical problems or things that fell on the floor. Really just work agency by agency, data set by data set to understand why, you know, what and why of, uh, of metadata. Uh, also, uh, we've done a lot of work supporting the Justice 40 initiative with the um, GSA team there, 18F team, and also uh, uh, really doing all we can with the uh, 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 climate uh, work and, uh, and Chris. And we're not gonna go into that, but there's a lot going on there as well. Um, next slide. So getting, getting back to the meat of geo platform, our job number one, is to provide complete and current federal geospatial metadata records with quick access to the specific national geospatial data asset theme services and data. And we've, like I say, we've hammered through this. We've built what we think is a really good interface um, to metadata. We, we try, we provide abstracts, we provide links to services. We try to cure, even in this discovery list, we do a, a, a uh, a ton of work to curate the list, uh, winnowing it down to usable, useful metadata, uh, normalizing uh, uh, agency names, normalizing file formats, normalizing um, or standardizing uh, uh, many aspects of the metadata to help make the customer experience uh, better. So things like, is it NOAA? Is it National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration? Is it Department of Commerce? We, we kind of streamline a lot of that on the back end so that you get a more consistent experience on the front end. Uh, next slide. And, and I, I, I hit this from the beginning, but I'll just, I'll just say it again. My, you know, my learning, it, what I've learned working on metadata for geo platform for four years or so is that it's way harder than I thought that the, um, just the mechanics of keeping a metadata catalog across the federal government um, is really not, it's, it's really not easy. I, th I thought I really did not, I really thought it was a straightforward uh, problem to solve. And this isn't getting into metadata content. It's not getting into metadata format. It's not getting into metadata standards. This is just moving moving the bits and bytes from one place to another to assemble a, a federated catalog turn has been a huge amount of work and it's only with support of somebody like like chris mcdermott that we're able to achieve this and we um you know we kind of point out a few of the problems here but um we're doing i i think as good a job here at, at, as could be with a lot of help from the data.gov team and from the um data officers at each department and a lot of cooperation. I think we're building a reliable catalog 
of as much as much metadata is available. Uh, next slide. And I know FAIR has been spoken of uh, across this meeting and FAIR data principles. And I think what our point in geo platform is kind of really shifted. Yes, it's a metadata catalog, but a metadata catalog, so what? If the, it's a metadata catalog that's got to drive you to data, not just be a metadata record, which I think is a, a major difference between now and 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was, it was like an, it was an abstract of your data. It had the, you know, the fax number, who to maybe call to get it. But now we want our metadata to drive us to the data so that we can use it in machine readable workflows so that we can find, the, so our algorithms can find the data we need, so our applications can find the data we need, and we can act on the data without a human going to a portal to click on it, to look for the, file to download it to my local computer to process it to upload it to redistribute it right we want our federal geospatial data to participate in cloud native processing and be part of workflows and geo platform can't solve that but what we're doing is using our tools to help drive metadata in that direction and again chris will talk more about that in his uh, section uh, next slide as, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll skip through this, but we have this section now called Fair Insights, and Chris will talk about this in great detail, talking about how your metadata, how we objectively look at metadata records to describe their relative fairness. Uh, next slide. And when things are fair, or at least findable and accessible, what we demonstrate in GeoPlatform is that we can do things with the data. We can find your metadata record. We can find your download from the metadata record. We can see that it's accessible. We can see that it's in an open format. And we can build pipelines to act on it and do things like have it show up in another browser. And we, we know we can do this straight from web feature service and automate it. But what we're showing here is kind of examples of data processing pipelines that could be built to, to tick off or key off the, you know, the next step in processing. Um, when viewing a web feature service or viewing a web map service is one thing, but having the data available in your system to act on it, it is another, notwithstanding the availability of web processing services. There's a lot of other ways to act with geospatial data. Okay, next slide. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, another key piece of GeoPlatform has been communities. Uh, we've been using WordPress uh, for a long time. WordPress with our own custom or homegrown uh, 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 mapping and tools and curation tools. They predated Esri Hub and the idea of uh, when there was just ArcGIS online, we had this set of tools that were WordPress and Map Viewer. Now Hub's kind of kind of built out and taken over that ability, or not has has advanced that ability uh, beyond where we were in GeoPlatform. So we've retired our WordPress um, and mapping tools in favor of using uh, Hub now for community curation and registering assets and describing assets and building. Uh, uh, a curated uh, set of information as opposed to just an automated retrieval. All right, next slide. I think I'm almost done. Um, as I mentioned, uh, again, uh, GeoPlatform frequently asks questions. So much information out there, so much guidance. We're really trying to provide not just access to standards, but access to best practices or what we consider to be best practices or what we consider to be practices that make our lives easier rather than harder. Um, and so you see, we have some proposals as far as uh, formatting, um, specific guidance on uh, uh, how to fill out some uh, 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 data elements and ISO metadata when there's ambiguity um, and so on. And uh, a standard that we propose on agency and bureau names when uh, uh, one does not exist um, within the metadata editors. Uh, next slide. 
and again, uh, all the work we're doing, uh, open source, uh, uh, community source, we're, we're sharing as much as we can. Every time we do something that we think is neat, we're taking some time to uh, build a demo, post the demo, post the source code, so that uh, the next person down the line can hopefully build on it. Uh, next slide. And uh, we've got a bunch of, bunch of links. We have a bunch of pieces of GeoPlatform. I put them all here. Uh, we'll come back to this at the end, but we have a link to our, our GeoPlatform portal, our code repository, our demos, our map viewer, our ArcGIS Online and Hub, uh, direct access to our data catalog through GeoNetwork, direct access to our web service through GeoServer, our API through GeoAPI, and our stack catalog. So a bunch of pieces there. You can get to all of them right from the GeoPlatform homepage. Um, and again, just setting this up, I think these are all um, I feel like we're in the first quarter right now. Like we, we've gone through our training, we've set this whole um, infrastructure up, rebuilt this infrastructure, um, and, and we're we're here here to help and figure out what we can do to put these tools to good use for the community. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chris McDermott. So, any question? The percentage of people in the room wearing jackets. I think it's about. 90% of the people wearing jackets. Uh, percent, of people online, people percent of people online wearing jackets? About, about zero. And the, yeah, I'm not sure online, but uh, at least in the room, most of us are wearing jackets uh, here. Any, any questions uh, for Joel? There might be a couple in the chat. Uh, okay, metadata for the Metadata for the presenter's comment <laughs> on it being cold in Pittsburgh. Uh, you need to measure. All right. We'll these, uh, <laughs> all right. We, we got all those. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll come back. Collect. Yes. So I'll go uh, to present the, the next section here. Let me get rid of this chat thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, there. Okay, there is. Oh, good. Is uh, there's a question online? Is there a, a metric of consumption of of services? Of it, yes, we're just getting there, and it's a really good question. Um, we we're just starting to collect metrics on what who leaves Geo Platform by clicking on a uh, metadata record. We're we're just starting to collect that. And we can certainly, we would report that. Yeah, and one of the challenges with collecting the, the metrics is that uh, some people might find a geo platform through a, a Google, find records in geo platform through a Google search, and we wouldn't necessarily see those, but that would be other uses of that too. Um, the next question is from the room. Uh, Thank you. Hey, Joel, this is Jonathan Blythe from BOEM. I, uh, I was curious if you um, have been using a uh, knowledge graph uh, on any of these, are any of these links to your knowledge graph or do you have that technology somewhere in your stack? And um, earlier we had a session on Knowledge Graph Federation. Uh, the Discovery Cluster and ESIP is looking at this as a possible way to bring different agencies together and uh, to share metadata through the common metadata repository in our usage-based discovery tool. So if you have a Knowledge Graph, maybe we could talk to you about how these different um, systems can share metadata. Yeah, so you, you, did, you hit on our, you know, right where we are. If I had top 10 for 2022, that was the 11th, or that was number one for 2023. We're doing quite a bit of work there, um, thinking about how we can participate in that, in a knowledge graph, um, how we can format our data. We've done a ton of work there. It's not really been ready for prime time, um, but the, we're super interested in it. And I know Chris and I have been talking all week about how many briefings there have been 
um, that that hit on the area of knowledge graphs where we're uh, most of our development right now is really focused. I think I didn't discuss it in this briefing because I really wanted to focus on you know our bread and butter work of make sure that geospatial that metadata is searchable in the standard way. But I think you're right on. And that's really the direction we need to go next. And I don't, Chris, if you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, interesting talks on knowledge graphs this week. And we'll definitely uh, be involved in the, the cluster to learn more and to share what uh, we've developed uh, or what we're developing along the way. Um, I'll, there's another question in the room, but I'll, I'll refer to this question online. How will Geo Platform be integrated with other government run platforms. So, um, can, you can you clarify? I mean, we, we participate with data.gov, but I think what we're trying to do, um, but let me, let me, if there's any clarification on that question on how to oh, Yeah, uh, this is Bob Downs. I'm glad to clarify. Uh, there are lots of uh, government run platforms out there that are all uh, really serving as uh, catalogs for geospatial data. And uh, for example, we have the, the NASA Common Metadata Repository. Uh, it's, and that's just one of many. Right. So Geo Platform is gonna be another of many. <laughs> so how do we integrate these? Uh, or more specifically, how will the Geo Platform be integrated with the other government run platforms so that if you're accessing as a user, you know, from the user's perspective, if you're accessing the uh, geo platform, uh, how will it be less confusing if the same records are on another platform? Uh, are we going to uh, uh, allude to the ex uh, existence of the other platforms? Are we going to ignore the other platforms? Are we just gonna provide access to the source of the data? I mean, there are lots of different ways or all of these that you could approach. So. Right, a, a, gr a really great question. Um, and my opinion is that geo platform help drive traffic back to the other platforms. Um, so we're, we little geo platform are not gonna subsume the role of NASA data distribution but there are many NASA, you know, but there are so many data distribution place, places. And if we can help drive traffic to those by federating metadata, I think we'll be doing something useful. Um, we're also doing quite a bit of work um, with uh, um, search engine optimization, trying to make data more discoverable, you know, in the wild via, you know, via Google search. So you don't have to come to geo platform um, to find the record you're looking for. I think I, I, I'll, I'll just I'll use that, that word like, I don't think geo platforms in the empire building mode here to say we will be the, the true Uber center of all data for all time, you know, all places and all time. I think we recognize that we're a small program at service to the others and want to do what we can to support the others. And there was one question here in the room, and then we'll have to uh, keep moving to keep on track. Um, the slides will will be available. I'll work with the ESIP folks. We have them in the uh, Google Drive, and we'll get those moved on to this uh, Sketch uh, uh, uh software. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Mukul Sanwalkar, SSAI, NASA Goddard. I uh, was wondering if uh, should is it fair to say the geospatial uh, catalog is uh, primarily GIS specific data set uh, that can be uh, plug and go uh, either as uh, web APIs or services, or would it be uh, considered as a set of lists of backlinks to the actual source? In this case, it could be another catalog, uh, the, the CMR catalog at NASA, or probably even uh, data.gov. So, and at what maturity level is this? And uh, is it okay to uh, use that as authoritative uh, or links to authoritative data sets that uh, different groups have? 
Chris, do you want to take that or, I, I, or should I? Yeah, go ahead, Joel. Okay. Um, I think I think the answer is both. I think I think our vision is to be able to discover data, not just portals, but we, you'll see in some of our briefings, we're starting off with some, we have some portals, right? We don't have access to all, we have not ingested all federal geospatial metadata. Um, and we're not sure that that's feasible. And we we're, you know, we have a certain amount of data coming from data.gov. We have data coming from other sources, but how we grow from here is really an open question. You know, is it federated? Is we, rep, we federate catalogs, we replicate catalogs, do direct searches to other places. Um, this, this is some of the things we're discussing right now as to how we can be useful. Um, and, you know, and 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 you know, and accomplish something within our budget that you know that provides value. So, on the the question of fairness, I'll talk about that in the next set of slides, and then uh, if that's okay, we'll hold the uh, climate uh, question uh, to the uh, to the wrap up uh, uh, session section. Um, so next I'll present uh, on so next I'll present on uh, metadata and my name is uh, Chris McDermott. I'm one of the uh, uh, DevOps uh, developers on Geo platform. So I'll talk about our data sources, uh, our registry insights and then the, uh, the fair insights and then also, uh, on one-on-one -on -one cons consultation to help uh, agencies that uh, have any issues getting their metadata into uh, into Geo Platform. Uh, behind Geo Platform is um, is Geo Network. This is an OS Geo uh, supported uh, project, and we use this as our catalog services. From this, we use the uh, the APIs and the Geo Network formatter to create the. Uh, geo platform pages so we put a skin over top of the uh, the back end uh, services that <clears throat> geo network provides and geo network provides uh, a nice set of uh, api and uh, uh, swagger documentation for the for that api and i can just pull that up uh, quickly here's just a view uh, of uh, our metadata in the uh, Geo Network catalog, and then here is a, a view of the API documentation. So you can interact with uh, the holdings in our catalog using this uh, this API. And, and our harvesting process, all currently, all of the harvesting happens through uh, through Data.gov. They're the uh, clearinghouse that we use to harvest in the metadata. And from data.gov on a nightly basis, we harvest all the, uh, all the geospatial metadata records. And whether that's a DCAT record uh, with a link to a geospatial metadata record within there or a uh, ISO uh, metadata record that's been uploaded directly into uh, uh, data.gov. And we use the CCAN API for doing that to, Harvesting currently, right now, we support the uh, ISO one nine one three nine schema. Geo Network has can support the the newer uh, dash one slash dash three uh, ISO schemas, but that isn't uh, supported through data.gov at this point. And then also through DCAT, uh, if there's a link to an ISO metadata record or a CSDGM record, we can also harvest that and pull that in. And we have uh, documentation uh, in our demo about how the harvest uh, pipeline works if there's more information. But what we do on a scheduled uh, basis, uh, we uh, run a Lambda that goes and searches uh, data.gov. And then we bring those <clears throat> data in, those metadata records into an S3 bucket that uh, we then trigger other things through using uh, queues to uh, then 
process that metadata and then pull that metadata into a geo network. And then also as part of that for NGDAs, and if you hadn't heard that term before, NGDAs are National Geospatial Data Assets. They're a list of about 200 curated uh, US uh, geospatial assets that we then process the data if we can get a direct link to the data source and provide some artifacts and some uh, services around that, that Joel will talk more about that uh, in his uh, next section. There's also uh, an FAQ that uh, provides information on how we harvest this. Uh, most of the, uh, the effort is getting uh, your metadata into data.gov and then we harvest uh, from uh, the data.gov uh, uh, catalog. Uh, the other uh, piece of this is the registry uh, insights. So what this does is this provides a a link to the our database of all of the information that we've uh, we've gathered harvesting this information into uh, into uh, data.gov and uh, we have the the dates when it was last harvest we're still working on uh, the resources within there and uh, uh, correctly identifying these resources but in here we would uh, have uh, links as we complete this links to instead of unknown but links to the esri services and identify those uh, directly and back to the right sides here and within there you can filter by the agency the the NGDAs, as I mentioned, and then the, the status of the the import, and we have links back to uh, the record in uh, GeoPlatform, and then the links to uh, this in uh, data.gov. And as I mentioned before, uh, each one of the records, whether it's currently in data.gov or if it's uh, an obsoleted record, uh, we still have that information in there. So. One of the things that we're looking to do as we go forward is to help agencies with reporting on their records in uh, GeoPlatform. So we'll be using the same registry to report out uh, the status of each agency's uh, records. The next piece that uh, Joel has talked about before is the FAIR Insights. Uh, and what this is, is this is a way to help agencies improve their, their metadata. So the basis for these FAIR insights are the FGDC technical guidance uh, and metadata recommendations for data.gov and GeoPlatform. And there has been a group there that's uh, worked on these uh, uh, for quite a while, and we've been involved in helping update these. Uh, they were just updated this, this past year. So this is the set of best practices that we use for GeoPlatform and for <clears throat> metadata ISO. Uh, ESIP also has an, a metadata, an ISO metadata explorer, as well as NOAA for also providing best practices for for the metadata, and those both of those are are useful. And then we provide a tutorial of the the fair insights, and let me just give a uh, view of this. So <clears throat> within these, we uh, check the downloads and links to make sure that they're working correctly. We check for image uh, size and uh, that one exists, and this is the browse graphic. Um, we also check for points of contact. Uh, we check for valid uh, spatial and temporal ex extents. Uh, the maintenance uh, frequency is uh, of the data updates. We check to see that data is being updated on those uh, documented frequencies. And then one of the things that we're really <clears throat> trying to do is understand the links to the data. So we're really concerned about being able to determine the format of the data that's being linked to so that we can provide that information for a user to be able to uh, get to that data either through the searching or through, uh, or through linked uh, services. And then we also validate on services or 
vocabulary codes <clears throat> and code lists being used within the services. So I'm, this is just a few screenshots of the different uh, sets of uh, uh, viewing this. So you can view it both by aggregated to the agency or uh, within each uh, metadata record. And this one goes through the, the browse graphic uh, that we're looking for and the sizes based on those best practices. And then this one talks about the, the format names. And we use, uh, <clears throat> right now for the format names, we use the GDAL uh, uh, known uh, formats for raster and vector graphics to try to determine the, the formats that, that we understand and can convey that information to users of the geo platform. And this is the point of contact that I talked about. <clears throat> the other thing uh, is that if any agency has issues getting their data into uh, Geo Platform, we can provide one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting. And I've probably met with maybe a dozen and a half or, or more agencies at this point to uh, work with them to help them get their, their data into uh, Geo Platform. And even if it's something simple, it's probably something that we've uh, talked about before, and uh, we can help you with that versus uh, you trying to figure that out on your own. Uh, questions? Um, I've seen that uh, metadata best practices document somewhere, but uh, like before, but where, where is it? Where does that live? <laughs> oh, it's, it's hosted on the, uh, the FGDC uh, site. If you look for FGDC um, uh, metadata, and here's the link there. And is there, um, what's, what's the process? Like who, who's involved with like, you know, updating that document or making the decisions in there? Um, it's FG, the FGDC NGDA team is the one that's responsible for uh, uh, maintaining and updating that uh, document. And uh, Lorna Sch Schmidt is the, uh, the lead person uh, that's been working on that, although she's working towards uh, retirement uh, these days, she's still involved uh, part-time uh, uh, managing that. And then you mentioned that there are some other um, organizations that have metadata recommendations, uh, best practices, and I'm wondering yes. uh, how those all kind of like get adjudicated. Oh, so, is, oh sorry, Chris. I was, I was, go I was, ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was going to add, um, I, I'll, answer the sec I'll answer your second question, but on the first question on metadata standards, uh, if you're interested, uh, there's a, there's a place. So there's a very small number of people who are interested and knowledgeable about metadata. And um, if you've got insights or time and energy, uh, the FTDC team, the metadata team can definitely use your use your use your help. So uh, email Chris or I, and we'll help will take as much advantage of your, your time and interest as you have on this. Um, it's collaborative, it's adjudicated, it's community-based, but it's a small community. And that gets to the other piece that you, your second question on um, rec what about guidance for best practices versus recommendations. And that, that kind of points to a problem with the process. So here is the geo-platform metadata recommendations formally produced by the Federal Geographic Data Committee. And we as Geo Platform kind of, imp so these become, these are policy that are, have been kind of agreed to. Ours are nice to haves. And so we've not vetted them through a process. We've called them best practices based on our, te our team's knowledge but they're not formal guidance to anyone. Um, they're asks, not tells. Um, and, uh, or they're asks, not even recommends. 
Um, and we've gotten some, you know, some people have came back to us and said, well, why are, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you putting out these recommendations? Just make them guidance, make them policy. It's, the problem is the policy process takes a long time. So it's cheap and easy for us to put a good idea up as a recommendation in GeoPlatform. It's more elaborate to make a recommendation and it's even more elaborate to make a requirement. Yeah, I, and I just asked that question because I, I remember trying to do uh, like machine to machine uh, kind of like, you know, metadata based mm -hmm. um, workflows like within the integrated ocean observing system, which of course is a bunch of different federal agencies and, and um, you know, we're trying to figure out where you where you put like certain types of endpoints, like for instance, an open app endpoint in the F mm -hmm. in like ISO metadata or an FGC metadata. And, <laughs> and it's gotta be the same, right? And all these different right. things for it to yeah. actually work. And, and then we found out, you know, we, we were all happy within our little world. And then we found out, oops, nobody else does it this way. <laughs> exactly, talk, talk to Chris and I, and we can, we can help with that. Maybe we can spin things as we're processing metadata. We can put out recommendations and we can reach out because one of our fair insights has been, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity in the guidance, you know, a publisher or a download link versus a homepage versus an endpoint. Um, sometimes it's just not clear and, and, and we can help on that um, because what the problem you just explained is, is the problem everywhere. And it's kind of what the problem we want to help solve. Like I'm trying to automate something. I'm looking at these metadata records, and they're all different. That's that's our that's our lane. We think. Yeah, the the challenge is there's multiple ways to mark it up for a service. You're doing a, a data set uh, record. Well, where does a service fit? Do you do a standalone uh, service record? But if nobody's using those standalone service records, what's the point of creating those service records? And that's been a, a struggle and. One of the things that I try to do is look at what uh, the folks are doing out at, in, in the wild, whether it's NOAA or the ESIP guidance, uh, the ESIP ISO Explorer or the NOAA ISO Explorer or what NASA is doing for guidance on their uh, my, metadata. But there's multiple ways to mark things up. And if somebody doesn't know where that is or can't use it, then what's the point of, of doing that? Um, to keep things on time, I'll go ahead with the next uh, presentation here on the on the geoplatform uh, infrastructure. And I'm presenting this for uh, Tim Zawalski, and uh, and he couldn't uh, be here uh, today. But he's one of our he's our lead uh, developer on the architecture for for geo platform behind uh, geo platform we use the uh, we run this all in uh, AWS uh, at this point and behind and we try to use the cloud native services wherever uh, possible uh, one of the uh, things that we're using is the RDS service in in AWS. And this is great that it gives you pretty much everything you need out of the box. One <clears throat> issue that you could run into is that the Postgres extensions aren't all uh, supported within RDS, but thankfully the PostGIS one is. And we're also using uh, the RDS uh, pooler here. This allows for uh, the, our service approach with many short-lived uh, database connections. Uh, one of the things we've run into with that is that uh, this doesn't support all of the versions and uh, how you use it is buried in, in the documentation. And since we're using Postgres, the scaling uh, needs to scale up instead of uh, scaling, uh, scaling out uh, vertically. So that's one of the issues that uh, uh, we've uh, encountered as we've done this. And so for... Most of our process, processing, we use uh, uh, Lambda uh, functions. We use, uh, on, for our use, we use Node.js uh, mostly, but this also supports uh, uh, Python and Java. And the key piece here is that uh, things need to run within uh, a 15 minute uh, uh, window, but it makes a great uh, a serverless environment that's just queued off of uh, either messages in a queue or uh, on uh, cloud 
uh, CloudWatch uh, alarms. The, and on addition to that, for things like uh, running uh, Tria map or for running uh, uh, Geo Network, we use uh, the Fargate uh, and the uh, ECS uh, service within, uh, within AWS. And for our uh, file system, we use uh, EFS, but there, there can be some issues with latency. We've been using this for our, uh, our solar indexing and we are running into some issues with that so that we need to, uh, as we go forward, look at uh, better ways to support uh, that uh, service. One of the, uh, the lessons I learned from running things in Lambda, sometimes it's difficult to see what's going on and what's breaking your Lambda. So it's really important to spend some time working on the, uh, the logging because a lot of times that might be the only way you have insight into what's going on in your, in your processing. And um, log early within your process because if your process fails and you haven't had any logs, it won't, it's not very easy to uh, diagnose what's uh, going on there. Uh, we use, also use the uh, cloud formation and set up our infrastructure uh, through that. One of the <coughs> uh, lessons learned on this is that you really don't want to put your entire application into one cloud formation stack. If something fails and you have to roll back, it could be uh, a long time before everything's rolled back and you can retry it again. And you lose a lot of time in your development if you're waiting for an hour for things to be rolled back and then you're waiting uh, another hour for all the things to be rebuilt again. So breaking up your, your stack uh, there is good. And one of the things that we've liked to use is the AWS uh, glue. And that just runs code uh, in, in response to, uh, to events. Uh, one of the tools that we take uh, advantage of quite a bit is, the, is GDAL. And we have a pipeline for uh, processing of the NGDA uh, uh, data sets when we can get direct access to the data. We <coughs> uh, pull those out and use uh, Ogre Info and uh, the GDAL transforms to uh, create the artifacts for each of uh, each of our national geospatial data assets. And then uh, putting this all together, uh, we pull the the ISO metadata, inspect the ISO metadata, uh, then we uh, pull the uh, the attached uh, file data file that uh, we can access. We index it in uh, our Postgres uh, database, and then use RDS uh, proxy with uh, Mapnik uh, to create the maps. Uh, and Joel will talk more about that in, in his section coming up. And Geo Network or Geo Platform is built on a number of uh, open uh, source uh, tools. Um, and this isn't the, the full list, but uh, the major uh, tools that, that we're using. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, so just a quick question on uh, containerization of ArcGIS products on cloud. Uh, either Docker uh, or any any such instance. Is there a white paper? Has this been done and implemented? Um, yes, we've we've uh, we've implement implemented using the uh, Elex Elastic uh, Container Service with with AWS. Right now, uh, when uh, the current team started working on Geo Platform. All of the software was uh, wasn't publicly available. We're working on the process to um, to make our repositories uh, uh, publicly available. They're not uh, at this at this time. They're not uh, publicly available, but uh, we're working towards uh, uh, doing that. 
And for the, as much as possible, we try to use the, uh, the containers that uh, the open source software uh, creators maintain and then do customizations of those uh, as we deploy them uh, within uh, ECS on Fargate. So uh, another question here is, uh, how does GeoPlatform uh, conceptualize accreditation, giving credit to the uh, data generator? Uh, Joel, do you, can you uh, respond to this? Uh? Yeah, you bet. I think, that, I think that's the easiest. We show the full metadata record in GeoPlatform, and it's funny, Chris and I were talking about this before we started. We really should have just shown a full metadata record or a search in GeoPlatform. We show uh, the producer, we show the source, and we actually link to the original metadata record. So everything in GeoPlatform is all about crediting the provider and dri again, driving the information back to the provider. Everything a provider of data puts in their metadata record is then accessible in GeoPlatform and we don't do uh, anything to uh, obfuscate that. So this is a little summary card for a record, but once you click on the details, um, there you go. It's, it, um, it has all the information that was in the metadata record. Does that answer the question? It really is, um, it's about, uh, it's about being the catalog and helping you find the providers, provide the producer, uh, find the producers in the point of contact. This is just, this isn't the best formatted metadata record, but there it is. Point of contact is always, always there. Good. Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, again, I think our goal is to not obfuscate anything about source, uh, ever. So uh, I'll go ahead and hand it back to you for the next uh, section here, Joel. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, this is the technically most difficult part of this briefing. We're going to switch back and forth between some slides and some videos just to keep uh, uh, things moving. Uh, we're going to just show uh, some of the services that GeoPlatform provides. Um, and places we, again, I think we can build out. This is uh, Ian Schillen's briefing. I'm, uh, I'm doing this briefing for him, but I think we can cover it pretty well. Uh, this is just another set of the, this is uh, APIs for GeoPlatform. Uh, in GeoPlatform, we have a map viewer. Um, we have a map viewer because all GIS sites should have a map viewer. Um, what I think is uh, unusual or interesting about ours is we try to is that we try not to curate a specific list of data layers and be um we're not a specialized map viewer we're trying to be a, a just a bread and butter viewer and and feature services that are available so we're not being the national map we're not a climate portal we're not anything other than kind of listing services and service endpoints to drive traffic back to the um, to the source. So uh, I think we've got a little video of our Taria map working. I don't know if people use Taria map much, but it's a nice. It's a it's pretty nice open source. Comes from uh, Australian government, and we found it uh, to be pretty useful to work with as uh, just a bread and butter map viewer. Tell search, can search your metadata. That it's the map points back to the URL again of the source. That was our key point. Where did it come from? See, we don't do a ton with styling. We're just showing a default default view of this data set. Okay. 
other federal geospatial data we were able to pull from other data catalogs. Amerigeos is another data catalog. And then this, this tool allows you to add your own data and other websites uh, if you want to use it for uh, your own mapping application. But really the goal here is to discover mapping services to use elsewhere. Change map background. I think we can make it spin. Level of story map capability to generate, um, to add your content and uh, make a persistent URL to recreate the, the view. That's our map viewer. Uh, next service is our uh, spatial temporal asset catalog. Um, certainly this is a really important subject and important capability within the earth observation community. Um, we're seeing lots and lots of uh, imagery in this format. We're able to access um, a number of the NASA catalogs this way. Um, and we're really interested in how we can add, how we can effectively use stack catalogs going forward. Um, we'll show you what we've implemented now. Um, I think it's like a, a zero, it's, it looks nice and it totally runs. Um, but I think as far as being where we want to go with stack, it's, we're still pretty early on in our, um, so again, yeah, so here's the idea we're, we're, um, Always, as I said, as I've said, driving traffic back to other sources. We're showing you where it came from. We're showing you the source. Um, and now we're able to view it here. But what we're really highlighting is, um, uh, you know, the way the data was provided by the Forest Service in this case enables this capability. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, we haven't processed this data in any way. We're just accessing the data in a specific way. Uh, yes, correctly. And this, oh. this is showing this through uh, geo, the Geo API. Right. Uh, I might have, I might have been good. I might have been out of, out of sync. This is a, right. So I, I, I briefed initially like we were showing our stack catalog, but this is our Pi, this is our Geo OGC API interface that we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the reference implementations of the OGC uh, uh, APIs. And we thought this is important as the PyGeo API, the OGC API, it was important to add um, because it makes the geospatial data available in a, you know, in a, to a different community. And we all, if you're a geospatial person, you know the OGC WFS, WMS, um, but that's a, just a different, way of looking at data. Here's the stack catalog, um, digging in. Again, this is where I said we're very early into it. We're really just uh, browsing other catalogs. We're not really processing the data that was in the catalog. To add, we're, not adding much we're not adding value here on the geo platform side. We're just browsing other catalogs, which is something, um, but not as much as maybe could be done in the future to really uh, support um, you know, a federated search across catalogs. And this is using the uh, Radiant Earth uh, Stack uh, browser. And you can get to these services that with, at uh, stack. Uh, uh, geoplatform.gov uh, or geoapi.geoplatform.gov. And, and here, here's the last piece. And again, this is, a, this is kind of a demonstration. It's, it's important to us. Um, we, we call this uh, the magic process um, for modern accessible geospatial information cache. And what we, what we do is, and it's really like a really just proof of concept. Um, what we say is um, we look at a set of geospatial data and we see that it's got a zip file download of a geo database or it's got a web feature service. And we say, well, that's well and good, 
but I want to have this data in my own, I want to have this data in my pipeline to do something with. And so what we do is cache it and we try and cache it in, in, the, in a set of web service, uh, 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 web services, but also uh, able for, you know, in an S3 bucket to be accessible for the next uh, process downstream. So the idea is, can we make a persistent location of an open format for a well-known data set that you can always count on um, as opposed to say, you know, some of the important data sets we use all the time, like national hydrography data set, right? If you're, if you use national hydrography data set a lot, you probably start your project by looking for the latest version of national hydrography data set, downloading the, the, the file geodatabase, extracting the features you want, and then moving on. What we're trying to do here is say, can we have a persistent location where you can always count on a GeoJSON that would represent the latest from uh, uh, like national hydrography data sets or large scale international boundaries. Can we put these data, can we make these data persist so that you can count on it in your workflow to always have the latest as opposed to always starting with a download? And that's, and the, that's the trick here. There's a question there in the, oh, in the yeah. back. Um, this this is using uh, the the stack that I talked about before. We use the G, GL pipeline to create these uh, different formats, and then for the WMS and WFS uh, services, um, we use a Geo server to uh, to provide those those services. And on here, you can see the the cached uh, services and the data sets that have cached services. These are typically the NGDAs. Uh, We'll have the, the list of services down here uh, that uh, are available for that particular uh, data set. And I'll go ahead and run the, the little video here. So yeah, these are the uh, cache services are the ones on top that uh, that geo platform is created and they're marked with a, a geo platform icon to distinguish those from the other ones. Right. So here's a set of vector tiles. You could just point to our our service and use the vector tiles in your in the next application. And again, we should we try to provide as much detail on this. And again, it's the notion of it's the first step in some useful process, right? Uh, somebody mentioned earlier wanting to do some kind of a specific data processing pipeline. Um, I think somebody should be able to do a data processing pipeline that involves using uh, uh, the authoritative uh, international boundaries, the authoritative congressional districts without having to start each project searching for congressional districts, searching for um, international boundaries. And that's the point here. And this one, it's not a question for this right now. Yeah, I have a question about what, what type of persistent identifier are you using that's always linking back to that GeoJSON? So within uh, within Geo Platform, when we harvest a, a record, we give it a UUID that we uh, then we have a mapping that maps that back to its the services that are associated with that. Also, that mapping maps it back to uh, data.gov where uh, we got those services. And then we also within uh, either DCAT, there's identifier that we also map into the Geo Platform identifier. Or in ISO, there's a, a file uh, uh, identifier that we 
also map to uh, the geo platform identifier. So is if a user is there and, and finding that 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 data set the most recent, is there a way for them to know and identify the, the version so they could cite it and others could know exactly what version they're using? Um, yes. Within a, within a metadata record, uh, It's a great here. question. It's, it's, I'll just say before Chris answers, I, I, if you didn't ask the question, if I wasn't here, I'd be asking that question. <laughs> yeah. So for a, a unique, I, for a metadata uh, record, there's two ways that you use to identify. Use the, the version is under the, uh, the date stamp. And then also under the identification, there's uh, uh, a unique identifier for this. This one might not have the unique identifier, but within the metadata record, there's a unique identifier. Also, uh, when uh, when agencies update their uh, uh, data set, there are ways where they can identify the revision data of that uh, data set. Not all uh, metadata providers provide the revision set data the data set, but if they do provide that, we also report that uh, in the metadata view, so you can have a, a specific uh, revision date for that data set if the data supplier supplies that uh, information. Okay. Is, there, is there an example, Chris, you can show us where we show our import history of a record? Um, yeah. Here we can show when we've uh, pulled this in from right. from data.gov. Right. We ha also have that as a, a way to identify the the date that GeoPlatform got the record from uh, from the data.gov uh, catalog. Right. But it's a really good question, right? So it's the knowing that the metadata changed versus the data changing is something that's pretty hard for us to figure out. So we can tell you our version and when we updated it, but tying that back, to, and we can tie that back to when somebody said the metadata was updated, but knowing that that's actually reflective of the data being updated is something that we haven't quite tackled yet, mm -hmm. right? Because again, we see a little bit of a disconnect between metadata records and the actual changes to the uh, data itself. Yeah, and uh, there's a question in GeoPlatform, is there a way for users to determine which is the original format versus the, the GDAL converted so they can choose the original for further analysis? So in that uh, example that we showed uh, uh, previously here, the items that are that are marked up with, uh, that are part of the, uh, the cache are marked with uh, a geo platform. Uh, let me see when this gets to that point. So here, the items that are marked, that are from our cache have the geo platform logo and then the other ones uh, are the direct links to the um, the census information, and we're still working on updating these these icons once we understand uh, the formats of each of these files. But that's the distinction between the two, so that uh, you can get to the originators' uh, services and formats, and you can also get the cache services from GeoPlatform. And I'll move on to here's the the last the last slide here, uh, Joel. Excellent. Um, so our our last point here, and I think we've made it throughout, is uh, not only we're we trying to be useful as geo platform, we're trying to be useful uh, uh, to the community by providing uh, as many examples of the work we're doing and the processes that we're using, so that. Uh, uh, if people who are not familiar with the approach can, 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 can learn and build on it. And so uh, a large knowledge base and a large amount of effort gone into uh, 
um, publishing our source code, not just publishing our source code, but publishing our source code and tutorials and implementation examples. And we have that at our demos site. And this video just goes through uh, a, a, a few of the uh, demos. And this is using uh, JS Fiddle. Uh, this is a nice way to uh, create uh, quick map views that you can put into your web page. I have a question. Uh, sure. So the cached services, they might not actually be the data sets if they're not, if they're like arbitrary binary files or scientific information. Uh, it's, is that a scope issue for you or? Um, you, is that just a technical limitation to be able to cache data? The, yeah, there, that's definitely a limitation of the, the data, the metadata supplier. If they provide a direct link to their data in a format that uh, GeoPlatform can recognize, a GeoPlatform can create those cache services. If it can't uh, get to that link, if it just goes to a a landing HTML page and you have to look around to find the data, then we won't be able to uh, cache those, uh, those services. But there's, and, and what we're looking for is, you know, is some kind of demand for the caching service. So we, Chris, Chris has mentioned a number of times, the National Geospatial Data Assets, a specific list of about 150 data sets that we're working towards. But if there's, high value or high use data sets that you know anybody in any community thinks would be valuable you know we're willing to add those to the cache reach out to the um, provider and see if they can make them accessible sometimes it's just a matter of updating the metadata record because um, you know they might point to a landing page but the zip file of the national data set was somewhere you know five clicks away and if you just include that national zip file in the metadata record, you know, everything changes. But sometimes it just takes you know, asking or knowing about that specific record. And so another question from the room. Yes, thank you very much for the overview. Um, you mentioned once during your presentation when the current team uh, started working with GeoPlatform and you showed some of the motivations from a 2018 um, act or law. So I'm just wondering, some of us may have seen presentations on geo platform predating that. And do you have any words about, I mean, it's great to see a long standing platform about how you change with the technologies and if there has been a change in the main goal, if we might have this old information in our head, how do you just give us the, the newest, <laughs> the newest gist? Sure. Um, team, times have changed and teams have changed, but I think the geo platform mission is, has been, been the same, uh, you know, discovery of federal geospatial metadata. I think, um, you know, there's been, I think three or four iterations of geo platform over time. And I think what I put back at the beginning was, you know, job one is metadata. And then we've got these activities around it, like fair, um, and our open APIs. Uh, previously, you know, the previous generation, um, there was a lot more focus. If you were if you were to briefing, we would have been talking about geo platform communities. Um, we would have been talking about um, uh, uh, enriching metadata with semantic uh, semantic information. Um, some of those things have you know kind of come you know I say have gone by the wayside where the communities was really important when it didn't exist in Hub. Now it's just now it's just out there the uh, content enrichment. Um, I didn't think it, you know, it was a great idea. It didn't really, didn't really catch on. So I think we, you know, we've shed a few things um, and regrouped on some core capabilities. We've taken, we've uh, swapped out um, some home, homegrown software for off the shelf uh, software. Uh, we've moved from a 
you know, from a, a Unix server in the sky to a cloud native architecture. Um, but I think, uh, you know, Jonathan asked the question, what about knowledge graphs? You know, we, you know, that's been, you know, kind of a key thought in geo platform for a long time. We put it on the back burner for a few years to kind of retool. And now it's kind of back on the front burner. Um, so I, I don't know if that really answers the question, but um, I think it, you know, I think it's been, you know, it's been a journey um, as technology's changed, as uh, thorough focus has changed. Um, uh, I think we're just, I think we're growing, but I think the guidance has stayed the same, uh, you know, discoverable, discoverable federal geospatial data. Great, thanks so much. And then my next question is, uh, if you had a bunch of people from agency science data management groups in the audience, what would, is there any question or message you would want to get them as a specific audience um, that, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, yes. I think, um, I think that's why we're here. I think we, you know, we, Chris and I and the geo platform team have been traditionally focused on the, the GIS community data, the, the data that comes from the departments and goes to data.gov, um, the traditional GIS data. But I don't think we've been as engaged with the earth science and scientific community, earth observation community as much in the past. And I think we're interested in becoming more part of this community, supporting this community from the geo platform perspective. So the question is to the community, what can we do to be useful? I think that's what, that's why we're here. And that's, that's um, the dialogue, you know, going forward, what can we do to help? Um, yeah, and we'd love your, your feedback uh, on any of the things we uh, <clears throat> presented today. There's a qu another question that we delayed from the uh, chat. Could you elaborate on climate mm -hmm. dash uh, slash Chris support uh, topic from the top 10 list? Sure. Um, the president's executive order on climate has a specific role for FGDC, Federal Geographic Data Committee, and GeoPlatform is here to support that. And that's most of that work right now. I think is going through NOAA and the Chris team, and I can't remember what Chris stands for. Climate resilience information, um, but the Geo platform is here to help as a platform for data as needed um, to make uh, climate data findable, accessible, interoperable in support of the Chris mission, the Chris and the climate mission. Uh, if, I'm not sure if that if that answers the question. I hope it did. If not, um, feel free to follow up or ask me to clarify. Any other questions? Well, I wanna thank uh, everybody. Oh, actually we do have one more com or comment or question here. Uh, oh yeah, that was the, it, that was in response to your <coughs> response uh, that uh, yes, that re answered it. And it's the climate resilience <coughs> information uh, system is Chris. So if there's no more questions, uh, I want to thank everybody for sticking around to the last day and uh, great, great comments and questions from the group. And please uh, send us your feedback. Uh, uh, thanks. And everybody have uh, safe travels uh, home. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Chris McKinney, for all. Thank you.